you're seeing, uh, you, we've been watching KFOR TV's live feed of a tornado that's in progress, almost wrapped in rain right on I-40 here, about 13 miles west of El Reno. Just to the Piedmont right now. Go, David Payne. Oh, Mike, it's crossing Gregory Road right now. It's right in front of me. Take our stream. It's a Maxi. It's another quarter mile wide tornado. It's a quarter mile wide, maybe a half mile wide Maxi tornado. There's a power. Yeah, it's a, it's a, look how big it is, Morgan. It's, it's oh, gonna... my gosh. Oh, oh, get out of here, dude. Get out of here now. Maxi tornado coming no. into Piedmont. Piedmont, Hang on. get out of the way. It was just after 3 p.m. in central Oklahoma on May 24, 2011. The weather throughout the region was unseasonably warm and humid, even for late May standards. In the days prior, meteorologists had been continually noting the 24th as a potentially major day for tornadoes and severe weather for most of Oklahoma. Now that the 24th had finally arrived, the significant potential was looming largely for the entire region. The entire region was underneath an exceptionally rare 45% chance for significant tornadoes. Rapidly throughout the afternoon hours, numerous powerful rotating supercells began to fire throughout central Oklahoma. Within minutes of forming, many of these supercells began to produce tornadoes throughout the region. However, one specific supercell began to rapidly produce a particularly large and violent tornado just southwest of the city of El Reno. In an instant, the over mile wide tornado, with estimated wind speeds of 295 miles per hour, tore through hundreds of homes and businesses along nearly 63 mile path through the highly populated portions of central Oklahoma. In just under two hours, the long lived and extremely powerful tornado decimated numerous suburban regions, killed nine, injured 181, and became the first EF5 tornado rated to strike the state of Oklahoma. In the days leading up to the 24th, forecasters were already highly aware of a potentially significant severe weather event possible. In the U.S., late May generally tends to be the most conducive period for tornado activity, especially for parts of central and southern plains. These tornado-prone areas of the central and southern plains are known as Tornado Alley. On May 20th, the SBC first noted the severe weather potential for the 24th. The SPC noted that a prevailing moist and unstable environment should be supportive of a strong to severe storm development. They also noted that potentially tornadic supercells would be possible during the late afternoon anywhere from north central Texas to southern Kansas. The next day, on the Day 3 Outlook, the SPC upgraded the risk to a 30% significant. In this discussion, they noted the instability and wind shear that the models were showing looked highly conducive for a potential tornado outbreak, but also noted that the best forcing may not arrive until after dark, which would limit the severity of the event. They also noted that the large discrepancies in placement and timing of initiation held them back from introducing areas of higher potential. As the 24th continued to grow nearer, the potential for a major severe weather event only continued to rise. The next day, on the 23rd, the SBC upgraded the risk to a moderate 45% significant risk for severe weather over a large portion of mainly Oklahoma and Kansas. In this new discussion, the SBC noted that a classic Plains tornado outbreak appeared possible across the southern plains. Also in this outlook, the SBC noted that an extremely potent wind shear and instability values would contribute to a significant tornado potential. Models only continued to ramp up throughout the 23rd. As the sun rose on the morning of the 24th, a powerful, negative tilt, upper-level trough was already en route to the southern plains. This powerful, upper-level trough brought ample low-level helicity values of over 500, which was highly conducive for significant tornado potential. In addition to the powerful, upper-level trough, dew points in the upper 60s to lower 70s were spread out over nearly the entire warm sector. These high dew points allowed for extremely potent cape values and the 4,000 joules per kilogram range. High cape values in conjunction with high dew points commonly allows for explosive supercell development if proper forcing is in place. Forcing usually comes in the form of surface boundaries, and on the 24th, a potent dry line was set to move across the southern plains. All of these environmental factors combined to create an exceptionally potent tornadic environment. 
Early in the morning, the SBC upgraded the region to a rare high risk for most of northern Oklahoma and southern Kansas. Throughout the day, the SBC continued to expand the high risk to include almost all of western Oklahoma. In addition, an extremely rare 45% significant risk for tornadoes was introduced for nearly all of central Oklahoma. In this discussion, the SBC noted that a widespread significant tornado outbreak looked likely through the afternoon hours. The SBC also noted that multiple rounds of storms would be possible throughout the day and could run into the late evening hours. Then, at 12.18 p.m., the SBC issued a mesoscale discussion concerning the looming tornado outbreak potential over the southern plains. The discussion highlighted the exceptionally potent environment in place. Then, at 12.50 p.m., the SBC issued a PDS tornado watch for almost the entirety of central Oklahoma. PDS, or Particularly Dangerous Situation Watches, are issued when the conditions are favorable for specifically strong tornadoes. The text of the tornado watch warned the possible development of destructive tornadoes, some of which could be long-tracked and strong to violent. Around this time, a cumulus field was just beginning to develop in west central Oklahoma. As these cumulus clouds continued to slowly move eastward into the moist and explosive environment, the dry line to the west continued to grow nearer. When a dry line hits a cumulus field in a potent environment, storms tend to rapidly fire across the boundary. This dry line was no different, and the environment ahead of the cumulus field was exceptionally potent. Then, around 2 p.m. Central, numerous potent supercells began to fire along the dry line from north to south in western Oklahoma. Nearly all of these storms quickly began to grow in mid-level mesocyclones, which indicates the birth of a tornadic supercell. One of these storms in particular began to become particularly intense, with its sights set on the highly populated cities in central Oklahoma. Then, at 3.31 p.m., the supercell produced its first tornado just west of Lookaba, Oklahoma. This tornado only lasted for 16 minutes, but still managed to produce EF3 level damage and grow to a max width of 800 yards. After this first tornado dissipated, the storm created a new mesocyclone to the west of the previous tornado's mesocyclone. As the storm continued to track northeastward, this new mesocyclone began to rapidly intensify. Then, at 3.51 p.m., as determined by mobile radar data, the El Reno slash Piedmont tornado touched down. In just four minutes, the tornado rapidly intensified to EF5 strength and grew into a large wedge-shaped tornado. The first notable damage from the tornado was to a large swath of trees, which was rated at EF5 strength. During this period, the storm was being monitored by a truck-mounted mobile Doppler radar operated by the University of Oklahoma's Advanced Radar Research Center, led by Howard Bluestein. That radar, stationed near the intersection of Smith Road and Walbaum Road, less than two miles south of I-40, captured the first polymetric rapid scan mobile Doppler weather radar data set of an EF-5 tornado. As the tornado moved towards I-40, the radar detected some of the fastest wind speeds ever measured on the planet. Interpretations slightly differ, but the maximum instantaneous radial velocity sampled by the radar was originally reported to have been 279 miles per hour, measured 200 to 230 feet above the ground at 4 p.m. However, the maximum velocity was later reported to have been 295 miles per hour, measured at about 72 feet above radar level at 4 p.m. in a 2014 paper by Bluestein. Maximum radial velocities were also reported to have remained greater than 268 miles per hour for several minutes. Additionally, multiple consecutive radar scans averaged to the yield an estimated 2 second average radial velocity of 265 miles per hour and an estimated 4 second average velocity of 248 miles per hour. This was reported as likely to be an underestimate of the true 2 to 4 second average wind speeds. The instantaneous velocity readings are not taken directly equivalent to the 3 second gust at 33 feet at the enhanced fajita scale attempts to estimate, but they mark the second highest wind speeds ever recorded in a tornado after the wind speeds of approximately 300 miles per hour were recorded in both the 1999 Bridge Creek Moor tornado and the subvortex within the 2013 El Reno tornado. Where the most intense winds are generally present in a tornado is an unresolved question, but the limited existing research suggests that wind speeds are likely to be highest closer to the ground. 
After the detection of the wind speeds, the quality of the data degraded into a collection ceased altogether at 4.16 p.m. as the tornado turned to the east-northeast and towards I-40, where it would produce its most intense damage. As the tornado crossed I-40, the Doppler radar was still 6.2 miles away and yet still recorded maximum radial velocities of over 220 miles per hour, 190 yards above the ground. Here, the tornado struck multiple people in their cars at EF3 strength. Three people, Terry Peoples, Don Wesley Krug, and Joan Krug, were killed in two separate full-size pickup trucks, which were hurled thousands of feet from the road. Their bodies were found more than 300 yards north of the interstate, outside of their vehicles, stripped of clothing, and rendered unrecognizable according to responding state troopers. Several others were injured here as their vehicles were battered and overturned, including a truck driver whose semi-truck was flipped. The interstates were left littered with pieces of cars. Two more fatalities in cars occurred just northeast of the interstate. According to the National Weather Service, the tornado was believed to cause its maximum amount of damage just after crossing I-40. Just after crossing US-270, the tornado then struck a complex of buildings at EF3 intensity. A repair shop, a garage, and a farmhouse were destroyed, and a grain facility was damaged beyond repair. Flying debris from the salvage yard impacted a new natural gas processing plant, but all the employees that were present avoided injury by sheltering on site in time. However, the damage caused a major gas leak at the plant, which was not secured until nightfall. The tornado then quickly reached EF5 intensity as it struck the Cactus 117 oil drilling rig site at the corner of Old 66 and North Courtney Road intersection, completely destroying it. When the tornado hit, the rig's pipes and drill head were inserted deep into the well's borehole, which provided the drilling pipe with 200,000 pounds of downforce. Despite this, and despite the fact that the drilling rig weighed almost 2 million pounds, the rig was toppled onto its side and rolled several times. The well's blowout preventer was left bent at a 30 degree angle to the north. Elsewhere on site, vehicles on cargo containers were lofted into the air and tossed. Twelve workers were on the site when the tornado struck and took shelter in the site's change house. Tied down by four steel cables anchored five and a half feet below the ground, the container was pummeled with debris. One of these cables broke and the container was dented, but all twelve workers survived without serious injury. The move to tie down the change houses for tornado shelters at Cactus Drilling Rigs had come just less than a year before the El Reno Piedmont tornado. Following the storm, Cactus moved to reinforce the change house roofs and position them where the rigs would be less likely to topple onto them. The overall damage at Cactus 117 rig amounted to $14 million. After destroying the Cactus rig, the tornado continued moving east-northeast. The tornado then passed between Fort Reno and an Oklahoma Mesonet site, which recorded a sharp drop in the atmospheric pressure, as well as a one-minute average wind speed of 115 miles per hour and a maximum wind gust of 151 miles per hour at 4.21 p.m. This gust was the highest wind speed ever recorded by the Oklahoma Mesonet. The site only sustained minor damage, with the tornado likely having passed several hundred feet from it. Fort Reno also sustained some structural damage. Also, around this time, north of El Reno along US-81, a home was leveled at EF-4 intensity. Leaving El Reno, the tornado then tracked through miles of mainly agricultural land. Widespread EF-3 damage, pockmarked by the areas of EF-4 damage, was found between the towns of El Reno and Piedmont. Around this time, an EF-0 rated satellite tornado formed in the northwest of the main tornado and produced minimal to no damage distinguishable from the main tornado. As the tornado neared Piedmont, it produced widespread EF-4 damage north and west of the town. About 3.1 miles north of Piedmont, the tornado leveled 10 homes on North Ridge Lane and rolled or lofted vehicles into nearby fields. However, surveys found that nails had been used to help fasten the walls to their concrete slab foundations, which had failed and left broken portions of the slabs where they had been driven in. The tornado then destroyed two more houses on Axman Street, 4 miles northeast of Piedmont. A Chevrolet Avalanche parked in the garage of one of these residences was hurled 710 yards to the northeast into a thicket of trees in the ravine, which was debarked and relieved of their branches. The Chevrolet's engine block and axles were found nearby, ripped from the car. The damage here was rated EF4. 
in the subdivision of Falcon Lake, five miles to the northeast of Piedmont, and on the border of Canadian and Kingfisher counties, multiple homes again had walls removed off their concrete slab foundations. Vehicles here were tossed into an adjacent lake. Two children, aged one and three years old, were killed in their home, which lacked a storm shelter. In all, the tornado destroyed 88 homes in the Piedmont area alone. The tornado's intensity then diminished somewhat as the tornado crossed into Kingfisher and Logan counties, having already traveled just shy of 40 miles on its track through Canadian County. EF2 and EF3 damage still occurred as the tornado damaged houses, destroyed multiple mobile homes, and collapsed high-voltage transmission towers while continuing to debark trees to the point where only stumps remained. The tornado then killed two more people who were caught outside without shelter near the community of Kaushin. Along SH-74, the tornado destroyed three homes and an airplane hangar. The tornado then approached Guthrie, but moved to the northwest of town, which avoided a direct hit. The tornado then finally dissipated northeast of Guthrie, producing only minor tree damage there. The tornado's parent supercell then went on to produce another tornado south of the community of Stillwater, which earned a damage rating of EF-2. In total, the tornado reached a maximum width of 1,760 yards, or just over a mile wide at its peak. The damage path of the tornado was also rated at 63 miles long. The tornado had traveled this distance in over the course of about an hour and 44 minutes, which rounds out to an average forward wind speed of approximately 36 miles per hour. On June 1, 2011, National Weather Service officials upgraded the tornado's preliminary EF-4 rating to EF-5 based on a combination of the damage to the Cactus 117 drilling rig site and complete destruction of other buildings at the rig's vicinity, tossed vehicles, and the mobile Doppler radar data. In the end, 22 tornadoes occurred in central Oklahoma during the El Reno Piedmont tornado's parent outbreak. In the Oklahoma City area, five main supercells produced 12 tornadoes, three of them violent, or EF4 plus rated. The El Reno Piedmont tornado was the strongest of them all. The El Reno Piedmont tornado became one of only 59 tornadoes ever rated F or EF5 to date, and only one of 10 tornadoes to receive an EF5 rating since switching to the enhanced Fujita scale in 2007. Additionally, the El Reno slash Piedmont tornado was the first tornado in Oklahoma history to receive an EF5 rating, and the only one until the Amore 2013 tornado. In the aftermath of the tornado, numerous organizations were dispatched to the regions hit hardest. Governor of Oklahoma Mary Fallon declared a state of emergency in 68 counties on May 24th, including Canadian, Kingfisher, and Logan counties, before taking to air to survey the damage in several areas, which included Piedmont and Guthrie. Then, on the 29th, the governor requested FEMA funding from the federal government. Fortunately, despite numerous significant and violent tornadoes near major cities, the fatality count remained relatively low for a significance of the tornado outbreak. This stems from increased preparedness and lead times from weather agencies, both government-funded and private. As the field of meteorology continues to evolve, the hope is that the number of injuries and fatalities from significant events like the May 24th outbreak continues to decline. Anyways, guys, thank you all so much for watching. I decided to get to let you guys vote on this one. Um, I haven't done that before, but I, I kind of like that because then you guys get to pick and, it, and you know, it just helps connect with you guys a little bit more and i'm gonna do that a little more often from now on i have a bunch of videos lined up but um i still like to have you guys choose once in a while because i never i didn't have this on my list actually so it really helped out and it kind of got me a different one and i wanted to see what you guys wanted to see uh but any, anyways even those videos extremely famous tornado like one of the most famous ever i'd still like to dive into some of the more recent and also some of the more lesser known ones from the past as well so i'll get into some of those videos if you guys have any ideas let me know in the comments um, I do always put those on lists and just have um, the idea for in the future. But anyways, uh, I don't want to take any more of your guys' time. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.